Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. I'm Brittany Felix, and every Monday I'll be speaking with someone that realized a traditional life with a soul-sucking 9-to-5 job just wasn't for them. They had the courage to go against what society told them they should want, and now they chase their passions all over the world. We'll discuss their unconventional journey and their exciting and sometimes terrifying travels. Every Wednesday we'll continue that conversation by talking about just how they can afford to travel so often and live a life of freedom most people only ever dream of. Every Friday, I'll answer your questions and offer advice and encouragement to help you start living unconventionally. If you allow yourself to be inspired by my amazing guests, one day I may just be featuring you in your world travels. Welcome to episode 55 of the Living Unconventionally podcast. First of all, in case you can't tell, my audio is not quite the best in this recording right now. We are actually currently spending our very first weekend, extended weekend, actually, in our new travel trailer that we're going to be taking on the road. But I had to come into town to do a little bit of work to get this episode out to you. And I definitely left my microphone back in the travel trailer. So I'm having to record this with just my regular laptop microphone. So sorry that the quality is not exactly the best. And another little warning, today's guest, Mari Connor, who is awesome, by the way, was actually the very first person that I ever interviewed for this podcast. So my interviewing skills weren't exactly up to par. I mean, I I definitely still have a long way to go anyways. You can always be learning and growing. But I didn't really even have the format of the show exactly down at the time. So it's going to cut off at kind of a weird spot. Um, It's not quite the typical interview that you're used to, but who knows, maybe you'll enjoy that because it is a little bit different from the rest of them. But just wanted to kind of give you that heads up so that when you get to the end and it doesn't end in quite the same way as all my other ones, you'll know something's not wrong. But Mari is actually the owner and creator of Marigold Marketing Group and more recently, Laptoppreneur. Now I'll have links to both of those in the show notes for this page that I'll talk about at the end of the episode. But Mari is so awesome, so sweet, so nice, has traveled all over from a young age even, being part of a military family. Um, She will obviously explain it much better than I can. So why don't we go ahead and dive right into my interview with Mari. Yeah, so if you want to just kind of just tell me a, a quick bit about yourself, Yeah. So I run a six figure marketing firm from my laptop. I focus on Facebook advertising, mainly for authors, speakers, coaches, and agencies, Mm -hmm. funnel agencies that need traffic. So I'm, I'm kind of known as the traffic girl when people need to come and see me to grow their email lists and stuff. Right. Essentially, I grew up in a military family and got a travel bug when I was, when I was young. And within the last year and a half or so of my business, I was just noticing that I was doing a lot of work on my laptop and Mm -hmm. decided that I didn't want to just do it in Phoenix. And so last December was sort of my first big trip, although I'd taken quite a number of small trips around the US, but I went to New Zealand for five weeks last December, uh, November and December, and then went to Bali in like February and then uh, Europe this summer for five weeks. And then I'm headed to Greece in January. So yeah, I've just, I've learned how to run an entire business from my laptop. I take all of my calls and everything from the laptop. I know you said that you're part of a military family and you caught the travel bug early. Do you remember your, your very first kind of vacation or family trip that wasn't part of the military experience? I think every trip uh, when I was younger was a part of the military experience. I can remember, uh, so I was stationed in uh, Mons, Belgium, from the time that I was six years old until 12 years old. And my, my parents actually put me into the local French section of the local Belgian school. And my brothers and sisters went to like the local Department of Defense, like American school. So I was always a little bit different even than my siblings and that. But as far as like actual vacations, we would take trips to my, my grandparents were kind of settled in Italy for a while because my grandfather on my mother's side worked for the oil companies out of Egypt. So the first vacation I remember taking was probably to see them in Rome while we were living in Belgium. Wow. That's a pretty incredible first trip. Right. And and how old would you say you were then? I probably would have been eight or nine. So do you remember a lot from that trip? 
Yeah, I, I remember, you know, thinking that Rome was pretty chaotic. Um, the way we traveled as a family, I think because we didn't have a lot of money, we were living on like my dad's, you know, one salary. Mm-hmm. And so we would usually either take like space available plane trips, which is where the military would set aside certain seats for military families that wanted to take an airplane trip somewhere. And they would only cost like 10 or 20 bucks a piece, but you'd have to like camp out and wait in the airport. So I kind of learned from an early age how to travel on a budget, how to be extremely patient in situations that were probably more difficult than most people that go on vacations. And then I just remember everywhere that we went, the majority of the kind of our annual vacations was down to Italy to see my grandparents. It was very chaotic, but that was very normal. Right. I think that's great because I think that transitions well into other parts of life because it helps you learn how to adapt easily. Yeah. In fact, there's like a formative moment. So, I mean, I ended up traveling a lot with my family in Europe, specifically if we didn't go to Italy, my, you know, we were in Belgium. So we we had such easy access to France, to England, to Germany. And a lot of times my mother, you know, just needed a break from taking care of us all week. And my father would take us on little road trips on the weekends. Now he was a historian. So he would take us out, not like to the Eiffel Tower in Paris, but we would go to like Napoleon's museum. Right. Or we would go to England and not go to London, but go look at battlefields that were now cornfields. Right. It was sort of a a reverse romantic idea of traveling. (laughs) It was, you know, we, we definitely were excited to go somewhere, but usually everywhere we ended up was like not at all what we were hoping for or expecting. <laughs> right. So I've seen, I tell people that I've seen more battlefields in Europe than like, you know, the average American female ever should. <laughs> Which uh, can imagine that's probably interesting at first when you're younger, but after a while, it's kind of like, okay, this is, this is just another field. I think when you're young, it's probably pretty difficult to grasp the concept of the magnitude of what really happened there. So when I was in college, I I ended up studying French really because it was the only field of study that I was doing well in. I I did really horribly when I first went to college. Decided to take French classes since I had learned French as a child and it made it so much easier. But I ended up studying abroad and my father was on some sort of a business trip where he was able to make a quick trip over to France to come visit me. And the minute he showed up, he he announced very proudly to every single person he met that because he had taken his daughter to Paris when she was younger, but never took her to the Eiffel Tower, that he was now, you know, making this official trip to take her personally to the Eiffel Tower. And he ended up, uh, we did take a three hour train ride from the city that I was living in. Mm -hmm. And our first goal when we arrived in Paris was to get over to the Eiffel Tower and to, uh, you know, go up to the second level or whatever and take like, you know, a picture of the two of us actually on the light, the Eiffel Tower. So he ended up feeling a little bit bad, you know, years (laughs) later, but he made up. I mean, I was gonna say, look at the incredible moment that it created that I'm sure that, you know, either one of you would never forget. Totally. Yeah, totally. I think he, he definitely out. kind of he definitely kind of mellowed out as a military guy later in life. And that that was a beautiful example of it. Right. So I know you said that was one way you were different from your your siblings when you were talking about the schools. Do they have the travel bug or is it is it just you? Uh, they do. Uh, they, they've kind of, you know, gotten married and they have settled down when they see my posts on Facebook or my entries online. Um, they definitely send me private notes and just say, we're, you know, we're so proud of you and we're so jealous and we wish we could kind of do the same thing. But I would say if when they get it, when they get the chance to travel, they do travel. So my, my sister went to Honduras last year. My brother and his wife are big, you know, cruise fans. So they mm-hmm. went on a cruise like on the Danube River and in uh, up near Finland and Russia. And then another brother just has young kids, so he hasn't gotten out recently. But again, if given the chance, um, I'm sure he would. He would. Yeah. It's awesome that they are supportive. I know that a lot of people that live kind of the the lifestyle where they travel constantly, they get a lot of negative feedback from their family. Have you ever experienced that from anyone in your life, friends or colleagues, you know, before you really decided you could work anywhere with your business? I think some of my clients over time haven't quite understood it, but when the ones that have stuck with me have seen that, you know, I do work really hard even when I'm traveling. And so they've learned that that's just a part of who I am. But as far as friends and family, uh, family, no. Family has always been extremely supportive of my travels. I think friends have been kind of spotty. And if they have been upset about my traveling, it's been purely out of love and caring. You know, they, right. they make it very clear that they just miss me or they'd like to see me more or be able to go out for coffee. But that they're, you know, again, I get a lot of positive affirmations on, on social media and in private messages and private emails saying, you know, good job. I wish I could do that. How do you do it? That's probably the biggest question these days is more like, good for you. How in the heck do you do that? Right. Which we'll get into that a little bit later. But I do want to say we're kind of in a a good segue because you get people constantly contacting you and saying, you know, how amazing it is. And what would you say to somebody who 
kind of desperately wants to essentially get out of their their normal traditional life and go explore the world. I mean, I think taking that first step is the hardest. So what what would be advice for them? Um, two things. The the first thing is just a mental hurdle to get over and just A, imagine being able to do it and B, know that you can do it. I'm a firm believer in where there's a will, there's a way. And I mean that from a time standpoint, from a money standpoint, from a, you know, probably even physical, emotional, mental is just know that that you have the ability to do it if you desire to do it. And then the second part would be uh, take baby steps, take a weekend um, outside of your town. You know, uh, get an Airbnb in in a town that's not too far from where you live right now for the weekend for the sole purpose of exploring that town and just start small. And then, you know, maybe take a little bit longer trip. I live in Phoenix, so I would equate that to taking a weekend in L.A., you know, finding Mm -hmm. an Airbnb, planning out a little weekend getaway, things that I want to do and going and actually just doing it and seeing that it's important to to have those smaller experiences because you'll see that the world doesn't fall apart. Right. And I think that that's, most people think that somehow their jobs, their lives, their friendships, their relationships, something will change if they decide to change something in their lives. And I think you'll see that, you know, a lot stays the same. Right. And I think that's wonderful advice. And I agree with you 100% that a lot of it is is a mental hurdle, you know, which is actually kind of where I'm at. And I think it's fantastic that you bring up that they kind of think the world's going to fall apart if they disappear for a little while and take some time for themselves. Yeah, it can it can be scary to do what you want. I think generally the way that our society is kind of set up right now is, you know, I, I, was, I even saw a billboard the other day that said something like, you know, your dream job is waiting for you. And I was thinking, I don't want a job. Right. Like, it was almost like totally oxymoron. And that's that's just how I think now is that there is no job that's a dream because I don't want a job. But the process it took to get there was, you know, taking a lot of like small adventures, just allowing myself to do things that I wanted to do is really like can be a huge hurdle. And then you do it once and then you do it repeatedly and then you can't figure out why other people don't do it. I don't care if it's like getting massages or wanting to learn tennis or learn a new instrument, you know, or travel, you know, just take it in baby steps. Right. And what would you say was your your first moment where you kind of realized that, hey, maybe I could do this a little more often on a little bit bigger scale? Was there a pivotal kind of moment or, you know, realization that happened? A couple of things. So I'll just touch on this. I know that we're going to get to the occupational part a little Mm -hmm. bit later, but I will touch on the moment when I made a decision. I was working at an alcohol and drug treatment center in Prescott, Arizona, and I basically was was on call 24-7. I I did love my job, and I did love that I was able to help people who couldn't help themselves and who were reaching out for help, and that was extremely satisfying. But I was pulled in a lot of different directions. You know, I had asked the management and the ownership a couple of times, you know, like, I just, I need time off. And I kind of didn't know how to really emphasize it. So they also probably didn't know how serious it was. Just one day, I just thought, you know, I think I can do something on my own. This is the second or third business that I've started and I've, I've helped increase their income like I do with every other business. And I just think I can do this on my own. But I think that moment was much bigger and it uh, reached into all areas of my life. And so when I made that decision, without knowing what business I would go into or what I would do and just went in and put in my notice, it freed me to start thinking a little bit outside the box. And then I did a little bit, I didn't do as intensive uh, lifestyle design as a lot of people do before they start their businesses. But what little bit I did, I just thought, I want to travel more. I want to be able to go places for periods of time, maybe be able to work. I don't even know right now, but I do want to go be able to go places in blocks of time. And so when I started my business, I was not making a lot of money, but on the weekends I would, I would jump online and I would go on to Travelocity or I would go on to, you know, Skyscanner or at that time US Airways was based out of Phoenix. And I would just check their prices. And like one time I found a trip to Hawaii for $315 round trip from Phoenix to Hawaii. And I just thought, I'm just going to try and make this work. Um, I wanted to go for four or five days. There was a conference that I wanted to attend. And I found an Airbnb for $60 a night. And I agreed that I would shop at the grocery stores and cook at home. And I couldn't have spent more than like probably about 800 or a thousand on that trip. And I'm sure I put a portion of it on on credit card and a portion of it. I did try to put on my debit card knowing me because I do like to be as responsible as I can. Right. Little experiences along the way and little doors opening. But that's something I always enjoyed doing. I could sit for hours and just look at airline prices and what deals are available and, and just dream. In fact, sometimes that's almost as, as nice as the trip. 
That's so funny you bring that up because I am the planner in my, you know, my relationship with my husband and with my friends, my girlfriends. Anytime we plan anything, I am like, okay, well, I'm on this. I'm going to go research hotels and flights and gas prices and all this stuff. And I, I say that constantly, that the planning is almost as fun as the trip. <laughs> yeah, I can visualize being in front of a certain monument, right. being in front of the beach or whatever. And uh, so even even that first couple of years when I when I wasn't making a ton in my business per month and really was having a hard time figuring out how business even worked, I did find another thing I would do is I would um, I looked up friends on Facebook who I hadn't seen for years and would just contact them and say, if I found a decent flight to wherever they lived, I would contact them and say, hey, I just found a flight from Phoenix to like Minneapolis or whatever for 250 round trip, some crazy cheap flight that I would always find. Mm -hmm. And I would say, do you mind if I stay with you for a week? I haven't seen you in 10 or 15 years since college. And almost every single time those people were more than overjoyed to welcome me in their houses because we were old friends and we had a history. Right. That's a great idea, actually. And I, my friends are scattered all over the country. And I think a lot of people would feel like we were imposing or things like that. But on the other side, connecting with people is really what life is about. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, if you put yourself in their position, if it's an old friend from high school or college that you really had a genuine bond with, you do want to see them. Right. And then you just communicate about what kind of works as far as day of the week. I mean, most of my friends do have children. I don't want to be interrupting their schedules and stuff. But I've gotten to a point where um, I have a number of friends around the country that I could call up right now. And not only, you know, would I would I be excited to see them. And a lot of times when I go visit these families, I'm not just there to kind of like use their place as a crash pad. I actually am pretty genuinely interested in seeing them. Right. So I do spend a lot of time at their house. I kind of help them cook. I like just experiencing like a different life for a moment, mm -hmm. which also it just happens to save money. And it's like the best things in life are free, which is like old friendships, laughter, you know, yep, just absolutely. hanging out at the house and cooking a meal together is like heaven to me. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. So, I mean, when my girlfriends and I, we all get together, we, we typically try and, you know, pick one person's house or a, a city that's in the middle and then you know, we just get away from our families and we just, we don't go crazy. I mean, none of us have ever been really kind of crazy girls or anything. We just want to be around each other and just laugh and relive those memories and just reconnect, which is why, you know, 10 years after college, we're all still fantastic friends. So there's no one that will give you more confidence in your life than really good old friends. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. Now, since you have been all over, we talked before about, you know, Greece and obviously France and all those places. What would you say is your favorite place that you've been to? The island of Capri off of uh, Naples in Italy. And I think it may be a little bit because it's obviously a very beautiful island, mm -hmm. but I've been there three times now. And let's see, once was when I was a child. I may have only been there twice, actually. Uh, once was when I was a child. Um, once was when I was studying abroad in Europe. And then um, I think the last time I went to Naples, I had the intention of going over, but I wasn't able to make it. But just, it, I mean, extremely beautiful island that I think holds a lot of beautiful memories for me. I think so many people get caught up in the beauty in the white sandy beaches and the calm of, you know, hiking in the mountains that they forget that, at least for me personally, and I would imagine for probably a lot of the people who listen, one of my favorite things about travel is just the feeling that you have when you're there. Just the kind of the ambiance of it and the emotions that it stirs in you. And so as odd as it may seem, I mean, I've traveled a little bit and we went to Paris for a honeymoon and I'm completely obsessed with it, but... <laughs> If you were to ask me my favorite place to vacation, it would be this crazy small little town in Michigan that I've been to <laughs> every year since I was four months old with my family. You know, yeah. we stay in these cabins. There's no cell service, no TV, no air conditioning for a really long time. Most most of my life, they didn't have air conditioning, but it's the feelings that it brings up when I remember it. Right, right. I think that that's, you know, immensely important. It's of no use to me to be somewhere extremely beautiful and to not have an experience go along with it and then have like a fond memory. Right. You know, I may enjoy, you know, whatever about the place, but you're right that memories help fill in the gaps. And I, I'm always, when people tell me, oh, I love this city, or if you mention a city and they go, oh my gosh, I love Chicago. It's like, I almost intuitively know now that something really good must have happened to them there. The way they right. react is because it's not just the city. It's not just the Sears Tower, but obviously someone you know, what, whether it be that was a, you know, a place where they had their first kiss or, you know, just had a, a really nice moment with family or whatever. When, when people kind of jump out of their skin and say, I love this random city. You're like, did you have a good experience like with someone there? Or, <laughs> right. Um, 
<laughs> and keep an eye out for it. The next time someone does it, I tell you, you will notice. And if you ask them, usually they do have a really sweet story. There is something, huh? That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because if somebody were ever to be like, oh, well, I'm from Michigan, my first response would be like, like oh, I we vacation there all the time. I love right. it, you know? You'd start clapping or something. Right. And they'd be like, uh. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so now, along with the memories and the, and the feelings, do you find yourself traveling with others or have you made connections with people in these locations that you revisit or... Yeah, so I'm I'm a traveler who definitely likes to split my time kind of alone and then with others. And I seem to have no problem anywhere I go making friends. I mean, meetup meet up makes that a little bit easier. Coffee shops and figuring out kind of where the entrepreneurial circles are has mm-hmm. helped out a lot. A lot of times I'll try to go somewhere because I, I have a goal. Like, well, when I went to New Zealand, I was going to Natalie Sisson's Wahiki, which is like an island off of Auckland. I was going to her retreat. And right. just sort of, you know, made a five, five week trip around that. And I ended up having a couple of other entrepreneurs that I had connected through Natalie Sisson's groups there. And um, same thing, I ended up staying, in fact, I ended up staying with this one woman and her family for like the week before the retreat. And I almost, I kind of felt bad, like, I don't want to go back to this woman's house, like right, you know, after the retreat. But I, so I ended up staying with another friend that was a relative of a friend anyway. But long story short was I missed the family environment. And I actually ended up calling her and saying, I am only calling you because like, I really miss your chaotic, <laughs> crazy family. And I had right. so much fun. And she said, pack your bags, bring your stuff over, you know, come and stay with us for another week before you leave or whatever. Do you find that you keep in touch when you're not in these locations with the people that you meet there? Uh, to some extent, I, you know, the one, the, I think one of the downfalls about social media is that I think humans were meant to sort of maintain maybe five or 10 really close friendships in their lives. Right. It's impossible to like maintain, you know, the two or three or 400 that I've met, you know, of, of people that I've met on all of my journeys. I do obviously try to check in with as many as I can. And social media has also made it easy to just kind of like stay in touch by liking their posts, seeing what they're Mm -hmm. doing, throwing a comment in. But yeah, I mean, maintaining like, you know, sort of deeper intimate relationships is pretty hard. Right. Yeah. And I think people who don't travel constantly run into that. And so when you add a ton of time zones in between and, you know, different cultures and things like that, I think it does make it difficult to stay in contact and kind of out of, out of sight, out of mind on both sides. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I know you mentioned a couple of, of things earlier, different websites and stuff that you use. What are your favorite go-tos now, app-wise or website-wise, to help you plan your travels? So number one would be Skyscanner, uh, which is a an app that compares airline ticket prices. Okay. So whenever I have a trip to take, I usually jump on a Skyscanner to kind of check the prices out. Um, at this point, I started out as a, I mentioned earlier, I started out as a U.S. Air sort of loyalist because they were out of Phoenix and American has since bought them. So I'm definitely, I, I lean towards American just because I have a bank of miles with them. But I'm actually starting to read a lot more on a website called The Points Guy is a website. It's a gentleman that keeps an eye on all of the point systems and where there may be like loopholes or deals or specials or certain credit cards you could sign up for to get more miles. I kind of let him just do the work monitoring that. Right. But on my actual phone, I would say what I end up pulling up regularly is Skyscanner. Um, when I'm in any given city, their metro system is an app that I become pretty dependent on. Mm-hmm. And then American Airlines. Oh, and Air, uh, sorry, I guess I actually I've got a few more. So American Airlines, because I am, uh, I have a miles bank with them. And then uh, Airbnb and Uber. And Lyft, if there's not Uber. Right. That actually leads into my next question. I was going to ask about Airbnb, and I'm glad you brought up Uber and Lyft as well. Do you find that those work out well for you when you're in other countries? Have you had any issues with using them? or? Let's see. So Airbnb, I don't know that I have used in another country. I think um, most of the time I've either stayed with people or in the case of the, um, when I went to Bali, I was going to another, so I went to a retreat in New Zealand, obviously ended up staying with friends before and after the retreat. And then in Bali, same thing, I was at a retreat. And I think we just, you know, actually, I think I found my accommodations on booking.com, which is kind of my fallback to Airbnb, that if I don't find what I'm looking for, for whatever reason on Airbnb, then I go to booking, which is like just the discount hotel website. Mm -hmm. Airbnb is obviously a website for people that are renting rooms in their homes. It's a lot more of kind of a, of an organic feel in any given city. Uh, But booking, you know, lets me know what hotels might be available at a discounted price. So I use that in Bali. Oh, I did use Airbnb in um, France this summer and it was a wonderful experience. I rented an apartment for one month. Me and another entrepreneur actually split the cost. So that made it 
it made it very cost effective to live in Paris for a month. And yeah, apartment was new, clean, exactly as the photos described. And then I like Airbnb because it also forces me to be a little bit responsible. I remember, you know, the night before I'm about to leave an Airbnb room or house that I'm staying in. I mean, I'm kind of running around the house madly, like, you know, cleaning and making sure it also looks nice when they return because you're rated, you know, both people rate each other Mm -hmm. both ways. The host rates the guest and the guest rates the host. So I, I remember it being very important to me that their house was left in the same condition so that if I ever wanted to come back, I knew that I could contact them. And I've made a lot of friends uh, through Airbnb, you know, with the hosts. With the hosts, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so far, uh, so far, no, uh, no issues. And what about, what about with Uber and Lyft? So Uber, I actually did try to, um, I did try to use in Holland and they just didn't have a lot of cars. And I'm not sure if that's because they have some laws against it, but in France, they had passed a law that said that um, Uber X or whatever their lowest cost Uber was mm-hmm. could not be used in Paris. It was like forbidden or there was a law passed that said no more Uber X. So you could get the nicer car, but then at that point it was the same price as the taxi, which is I, why right. I believe they took away the Uber X was the taxi drivers protested. And as far as I understand, the taxi drivers are really hardcore in France. They apparently parked their little taxis all the way across the highway that went from uh, the Paris airport to downtown Paris to protest Uber. So, yeah, they shut down the city and the city was forced to make some laws to accommodate them. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, and like I said, we went to Paris for our honeymoon and I can remember one of the biggest culture shocks and one of the the hardest things for me to grasp was just how chaotic the traffic is there. Right. And it gets worse. The further south you go in Europe, the crazier (laughs) it gets, if you can imagine that. I bet. Well, kind of leading into chaotic and crazy and (laughs) scary moments, what would you say has been kind of your, your scariest or most intimidating moment in all of your travels? So I would have to say that not much recently... So I'll I'll tell you about kind of, I guess, one more recent scary experience. And then um, another one that was a little more scary that I really got something out of when I was in college. And the first one is I was going to visit a friend of mine in Bahrain. And just the idea of like being a woman traveling alone, going to an Arab country that's like right next to Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. was just a little concerning. Like, do I, you know, so I had thoughts like, do I have the right clothes on? I made sure that day to actually wear like a longer skirt and just to have like a scarf on me. Right. Just out of respect for the country. And um, I remember having quite a bit of paranoia kind of walking up to the customs area and being asked like what I was doing. Because like in a place like Saudi Arabia, you don't just go visit a male friend. And I was visiting a male friend. So th- that you're not married to or that is not your father. Like literally, right. they, they don't understand the concept of, you know, long term friendships or any other definition of relationship, including boyfriend, girlfriend. It's just not something you do. And it's not really in their lifestyle. Bahrain does happen to happen to be one of the more liberal countries in the United Arab Emirates. So it was absolutely no problem. And in fact, when I told the guy what hotel I was going to be staying in, he, you know, recommended a steakhouse or whatever that was there. (laughs) And I I didn't get the third degree like I thought I was going to get. So that was like a little scary. You know, what what if they turn me away for whatever reason, because I don't have the proper relationship credentials? And how would I get back? Uh, The second one was um, when I was in college, I went to go visit because my father was in the military. He always sponsored uh, soldiers from usually Eastern Europe and Russia because that's what that's what he studied. And that's, you know, he did a little bit. I'm sure he was doing work like on the Cold War, you know, with the Russians Mm -hmm. back in the 80s. Who knows? He had top secret clearance. None of us know. But he he would always sponsor soldiers that would come to Leavenworth, Kansas, which is where he retired. And so one of the one of the soldiers that he sponsored, um, like our whole family got close to and they were from Slovakia. This was in like 1995, 96. And I took a train, you know, I took a train all the way to like Austria. And then you would have to get on the train to go to Slovakia. And this was like right after the the wall came down Mm -hmm. and they had just, you know, ended communism there. So railroads weren't quite as developed. They still had very old cars. I remember taking kind of like this, ending up on this chicken train, literally with like people and chickens and a lot going on. I didn't, but I was okay. I had my little wits about me and I was like, I'm just going to make it to wherever, you know, the town is that I was going. I can't remember. Liptovsky Mikulaj was the name of the city. Okay. And I arrived in the city and the soldier, I was, you know, 20, 21 years old. The friend of my father was not there waiting for me. And I'm like kind of in this communist country that's like, you know, being in a time warp right. with people who do not, have not been exposed to Western civilization. So there's no English. There's maybe a little German, but I've never spoken German in my life. 
And I just thought, you know, you, you can't help but have the thought in your head, go, you know, go around saying, you know, is he coming? And what do, if he doesn't come, how do I even buy a ticket to get out of here? Because no one can understand me. And so I, I remember actually getting on the phone and making some horrid collect call to my poor parents, you know, who probably ended up having like a hundred dollar phone bill <laughs> from me making this call saying I'm in Slovakia and Joseph isn't here and I don't know what to do. And, you know, I, I probably just ended up worrying my parents and whatever, but even, even being able to vent about it a little bit, calmed me down, but I kind of got worked up again. And I just thought it's one of those moments where you're just there with yourself, right? The only person that can save you is you. And I just thought I'm going to start bawling out loud. And I don't want to be in a country where I have no idea not only how that will be perceived, but if that's like viewed as weakness and people right. take advantage of me. So I thought just get, get somewhere where you can go cry now. And I went to some train platform where there was nobody around me. And I had like the biggest cry of my life all alone where no one could see. I got it out. And I just thought, you know, you're going to be fine. You know, you're going to go back and buy a ticket. Everything's going to be okay. And the next thing I knew when I stood up and turned around, Joseph had arrived. And it was like, Aww. I mean, angels could have been coming down. <laughs> you know, I, I have never been so happy to see an Eastern European man my entire life. And everything ended up being wonderful for the entire rest of the trip. And I, and I, I now appreciate that moment. I think that moment has actually helped me in a lot of ways throughout life and in work and stuff. When I've been in situations where I feel all alone, that one situation taught me I can get through it. And that wraps up part one of my interview with Mari Connor from Marigold Marketing Group and more recently Laptop Preneur. Now on Wednesday's episode, when we dig into part two, we're going to dive more into those businesses, just how she got started, the transition from, you know, working for somebody else, even though she did help start the companies, but still not being her own boss to now having a six figure business and starting this, this new one with Laptop Preneur. Mari gave some amazing resources today. So be sure that you head over to the show notes to check all of those out. You can find those show notes at livingunconventionally.com forward slash episode 055. And again, those are the numbers 055. And if you want to check out the updates I posted over the weekend of our very first trip out ever in our travel trailer, head over to the Living Unconventionally Facebook group. If you're not part of it already, click to join. We actually just reached 100 members. I am so excited. I love this little community. The people are awesome and amazing and supportive. Pretty pictures get shared constantly. Inspiring stories. It's fantastic. So just search for Living Unconventionally on Facebook or click the link in the show notes for this episode. And then after you do that, I will see you back on Wednesday for part two of my interview with Mari.